It is Sunday School, the last Sunday School of November. Uh, got a couple things. You notice that I've got my guitar out here. Uh, now I've had this guitar since nineteen. Excuse me, two thousand seven. I bought it new, and it's my pride and joy. I absolutely love it. It is a Laravee. There we go. Laravee. It's a Jean Laravee, OM zero three. It's not uh, amplified. I put a I put a a pickup on it, so it uh, so it can be. But I usually just play it stock. It has a history. I wrote the factory. I was so happy with it. And here's what they uh, what they said. Your OM03 is made from sapil. That's S A P E L E mahogany back and sides. So there's the back and there's the beautiful sides. The neck is of South American rosewood. Okay, that's South American rosewood. Uh, the soundboard is Sitka spruce. The fretboard and bridge are African mahogany. Oh, excuse me, African ebony. The guitar was started They've got because they got the serial number, so they know everything about it. The guitar was started on August twenty first, two thousand seven, and finished and shipped on Halloween, uh, October thirty first, two thousand seven. Now I purchased purchased it new at Sam Ash. Uh, guitar store in uh, uh, Santa Ana, California uh, on December 14th, 2007. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm, uh, it's one of my few prized possessions um, that I actually consider a prized possession. But shortly after I bought the guitar, Shortly after I bought the guitar, uh, my mother passed away. And she was 94 years old, I believe. And uh, so uh, at her funeral, I, uh, I played the guitar. You know, I think I had a chance. I can't. Uh, for sure recall, but I think I had a chance to uh, uh, play the guitar f for her because uh, she was always supportive or at least uh, cognizant of my magic or my mystical uh, musical career. Uh, but anyway, I played the song at her funeral. I played uh, uh, her favorite hymn, which just happens to be uh, the only hymn that I would consider my favorite uh, uh, hymn too. And uh, uh, my brother Mark was still alive at the time and, uh, and he and I were responsible for uh, uh, her funeral arrangements and all of that naturally. And uh, uh, it was held at a, a Presbyterian church and we had a chance to talk with a minister who uh, was just wonderful wonderful guy he really got a kick out of the duquette brothers but uh anyway uh, mom had a lot of friends from where she worked and and over the years and things and uh, mom was quite a character and i was uh uh, probably unwisely asked to uh, deliver a eulogy, and I've I've shared the eulogy with you before, and I th 
think the whole thing is in uh, uh, my book, Homemade Magic, uh, or someplace. And uh, today would have been her birthday. She was born on uh, November uh, 27th, 1913. I've posted a picture, a couple of pictures of her on my Facebook thing. So she lived a long time. She outlived two husbands, uh, my father and uh, uh, Bud Lees, both of them named Bud, as a matter of fact. Uh, and my father died uh, well before she did. He was uh, only 61 years old. Uh, but anyway, I thought I would share with you her eulogy my eulogy to her and uh, uh, here it is our mother had a great sense of humor so please don't think i'm being disrespectful when our words today might sound a little less like a eulogy and more like a roast mom was a real character I realize that term is used a lot, but in this case, it's absolutely true. She was a real character. Even in a crowded room or at a public event or a restaurant or a church, there was never a doubt in anyone's mind who the real character was. She loved people, but she hated all other living things. You'd never catch her patting a dog or stroking a cat. She strove to kill all insects, both inside and outside the house. She didn't even care too much for flowers because of the possibility they might harbor an insect. You never wanted to take her to a restaurant to which you ever uh, intended to return. She ran waiters and waitresses ragged. And if she didn't like the food, she would often call them over to the table and say, Honey, look at this. Would you eat that? She would then try to get them to eat a piece of it before sending it back. She never left a restaurant without at least one trophy. She always stole the napkins and was very generous with her booty. We have a pantry full of some very fine napkins and Constance... Constance and I use them pretty much daily still. Okay. Thanks, Mom. To say she was strong-willed and self-centered would be a colossal understatement. Oh, please know that everyone in the church listening to this, all of her friends, knew exactly what I was talking about. And this eulogy took longer than it's going to take for me to read because everyone was in stitches, okay? including the minister. Uh, to say she was strong-willed and self-centered could be a colossal understatement. If I were to use the title of a popular song to describe the character of this amazing person, it would have to be Frank Sinatra's my way. As a matter of fact, when she was in her late seventies, she demonstrated how true this was by having herself and her entire party kicked out of a Frank Sinatra concert at the Long Beach Arena because she refused to stop talking during his performance. Mom could be difficult to live with. When I was a young boy growing up in Nebraska, my father would often tell me, Lonnie, your mother's a wonderful woman, but she's difficult to live with. 45 years later, her second husband, Bud, would often tell me, Lonnie, your mother's a wonderful woman, but she's difficult to live with. Sadly, I must give her mixed reviews as far as her parenting skills were concerned. 
She subscribed to the old-fashioned philosophy that states a, a parent should never whip a child unless the parent is red in the face in the throes of a violent rage and completely out of control. But I'm all grown up now, and I've forgotten all about it. Because I was the second born child, I personally escaped many of the more severe and damaging effects her maternal learning curve visited upon my older brother, Mark in the six years before I was born. But Mark's all grown up now, and I'm sure he's forgotten all about it. But on many occasions, it was a very, very good thing she could get out of control and drive people crazy. When I was nine, I stepped barefoot on an embroidery needle that was lodged in the carpet. Mom rushed me to the doctor's office, but the doctor hardly looked at my toe. He gave me a tetanus shot and sent me home. Mom's almost supernatural intuition told her this was something more serious than a pin prick. She called the doctor back and insisted he take x-rays of my toe. He finally relented and arranged for x-rays. Sure enough, the film showed that the tip of the needle had broken off in my big toe. He said he would arrange to operate in the hospital in a few days. Mom told him it couldn't wait and demanded that he operate immediately. She told him that the needle could get in my bloodstream and travel to my heart and kill me. The doctor ridiculed this idea but finally gave in to her. That same day, during the operation, they didn't find the tip of the needle where the x-rays had shown. After several exploratory cuts, they discovered that it had entered a vein and had already traveled over an inch from where it had been just hours before. Mom not only had supernatural intuition, it appears she also had x-ray eyes. After all the cutting around my toe, with, my toe was a terrible mass of stitches. They wrapped up my foot in a thick layers of gauze and sent me home with orders not to walk for two weeks. But that's not where the story ends. In a couple days, Mom got another one of her supernatural feelings. Every hour or so, she would pick up my aching foot and smell it. She called the doctor and told him my foot stunk. He just laughed at her and told her it was the smell of the disinfectant and salve. Again, she did not let up. She said she didn't like the way it smelled and told him she thought I had toe main poisoning. That made the doctor laugh, and he finally agreed to have me come in. As it turned out, it, turned out, <laughs> it wasn't toe main poisoning, it was gangrene. And the treatment, had the treatment been postponed even a few more hours, I would have lost not only my big toe, but perhaps my foot or even my leg. And that's not the only time she fearlessly tangled like a mother lion with doctors over the health and well-being of a loved one. For as outgoing as she was, it was impossible to know what she was thinking. And I'm sad to say it was equally impossible for me to ever have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with her. I tried many times. The Vietnam War was raging when I was in high school, and I was passionately opposed to it. I became active in the anti-war movement and spoke out and demonstrated as much as I could to end that terrible conflict. One night, Mom asked me to explain the politics of the day to her. We had a long and what I thought was a productive talk. 
I drew her a little chart that showed the difference between right and left, conservative and liberal, and the dangers of being too far to the right or too far to the left. I showed her where Franklin Roosevelt and Kennedy might fit in on the chart and where Eisenhower and Barry Goldwater might be. Mom was uncharacteristically quiet during my whole little lecture. She only interrupted once to say, oh, we loved Roosevelt. This was not like her. I was happy to think that we'd finally had an adult to adult conversation. Perhaps I thought my heart has finally found her heart. We spoke no more of politics. About a month later, I was rummaging through the drawer of our living room hutch and found a letter from the U.S. Department of Justice. It was addressed to Mom, thanking her for her inquiry and gave her the name and phone number of a special agent at the office of the FBI in Omaha. Mom was at work, so I went to my father with the letter. He reluctantly told me that Mom had indeed called the FBI and told them that I had fallen in with communists and that they were teaching me to hate my mother. When she came home from work that evening, I angrily confronted us. She readily confessed and told me she would rather see me go to prison for a little while rather than ruin my whole life. How many of us can say that their mother turned them into the FBI for trying to explain the difference between Franklin Roosevelt and Barry Goldwater? But it's okay. I'm all grown up now. And I've forgotten all about it. On the other hand, it was not hard to find her heart when it came to her grandson, Jean-Paul. She loved him and he loved her. If not for Grandma Duquette, his childhood Christmases would have been very lean. He loved going places with her and still tells the story of their boat trip to Catalina when they both threw up on each other. Jean-Paul would like to be here today, but he lives with his family in Kyoto, Japan. That's where he was living at the time where he teaches at a university. Mom was quite the survivor. She survived the hardships of prairie life in Nebraska. She survived the Dust Bowl, the Depression, and World Wars I and II. She survived two husbands and all her brothers and sisters and cousins. She lived long enough to see many pictures of her great-grandson, Alexander. Shortly after he was taken to the hospital, she, uh, let's see, oh, excuse me. My uh, mom's second husband, Bud Leaves, was a very dear soul. He and mom attended Christ Presbyterian Church for several years here in the frigates. Hey, I'm an active in the frigates, it's a club. Mom lost Bud just a year ago, December. Like she did for our father, she stayed by his side throughout the entire ordeal of his last days. Shortly after he was taken to the hospital, she fell down at home and broke her wrist and shoulder. Within hours, she and Bud were together in the hospital. Later, when Bud needed to be moved to a convalescent hospital, she insisted on going there also. When they put them in separate rooms, she once again used her supernatural powers to conjure a double room where there was none before. She died one year and five days of Bud's passing. She was 94 years old. Lucinda Myrtle Duquette Lees was quite a character. Strong-willed, charismatic, and unforgettable. Yes, she was difficult to live with, but I loved her very much. I'm all grown up now and I'll never forget her. Mom was a real character, and I suspect she still is. 
Now, Mom had a beautiful singing voice. When she was a teenager in Nebraska, she'd been invited to join the traveling choir of Sister Amy Semple McPherson's Foursquare Gospel Revival. Years later, she'd sing for soprano in the choir at Methodist Church in Columbus, Nebraska. I warbled with her as a second tenor each Sunday during my high school years. It was one of the few things we ever did together without arguing. I guess I inherited my love of music from her. She bought me my first guitar and taught me to sing The Ballad of Jesse James and Red River Valley. When her friends or family came to visit, she always would insist I play a song for them. I was always happy to do it, but without fail, no sooner would I start to play and sing when she would turn to those very same guests and strike up a conversation as if I weren't even in the room. <laughs> I guess I know just how Frank Sinatra felt. I don't recall her ever allowing me to finish a song. So today I'm going to sing one of her favorite hymns and I intend to finish it. And if you're with your permission and uh, if you don't mind listening to a very rusty guitarist, I'll finish off Sunday school with a hymn. Let's see, ah, let's see here. On my Larravee. I come to the garden alone. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Not only is this my favorite song, but it's a hymn as spoken from the point of view of Mary Magdalene in the garden. She was the one to first see the arisen Christ. And it is the perfect song of devotion for the client and his or her own holy guardian angel, which after all was the real story behind the resurrection. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice i hear falling on my ear the son of god discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there no other has ever He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within
has ever known. So, happy birthday, Mom.